Therefore, it is now time for question period. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is for the Deputy Premier. The Liberals hired David Hurley and the Gandalf Group to conduct polling on electricity prices. And Mr. Speaker, you know what the polling told them? It told them that 94% of Ontario families wanted hydro relief. Why did the government need polling? Exactly, no kidding. <laughs> they told them that 90, they, why did they need polling to tell them what everybody else already knew? Three they could have walked dollars. into any, every, any coffee shop yeah. in this province, asked the same question, and got that answer. They could have knocked on doors in their ridings, and the answer would have been the same. But alas, this government had to conduct polling to tell them what the people of Ontario that they want relief on their hydro bills. Speaker, can the question. Deputy Premier tell us just when and how you became so out of touch with the people of Ontario? Thank Deputy Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question uh, from the member opposite, Speaker. Well, I think it's important that we look at what we have done when it comes to energy um, over the past many years. We took a dirty, unreliable electricity system, and we have made significant investments to make our electricity clean speaker. It's uh, an, an, and an electricity system we can count on. When we flick the switch, the lights come on. We couldn't say that when these guys were in charge, Speaker. We do recognize, though, that the costs of electricity are, are, uh, are really troubling for many families, and that's why we've taken very clear action to reduce the costs for people as we have, as we have made the investments, cleaner air, but we are focusing Answer. on reducing the cost. One, one item, and I'll be happy to go uh, further, Speaker. Um, Thank you. Supplementary. She's just confirming that they're out of touch. Not only did this government need to conduct polling to tell them what almost everyone on Tin Terry was telling them that they believed they pay too much for electricity, but the Liberals chose to hire their campaign manager oh. to conduct a poll. And they paid them with taxpayers' money. Three million dollars. There doesn't seem to be any high, any money for real hydro relief, but there seems to always be money to feed Liberal friends. Speaker, just how much money did the Liberals pay their campaign manager, David Hurley, to tell them the obvious that people in Ontario are paying too much for electricity? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, we are reducing bills by 8 per cent. We're cutting delivery charges to the most rural customers by 20 per cent. Our new agreement with Quebec will reduce electricity system costs by, by almost $70 million from previous forecasts. We've introduced the Ontario Electricity Support Grant Program, the Rural and Remote Rural and Remote Rate Protection Program. The regulated price plan, plan, plan rates will not increase for Ontario's residential farm small business customers. Speaker, we have taken a number of steps because we recognize the burden of electricity prices on the people of Ontario. And I, uh, I, I have to say I was really heartened when I saw the Toronto Vital Signs report earlier this year that said hospitalizations due to dirty air are down 41 per cent, wow. premature deaths due to dirty yes, air down 23 per cent because of the actions we have taken to shut down coal-fired plants. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. See, that's I didn't hear an answer about the cost. It's three million. I get phone calls and emails every day, like my colleagues, from families and seniors looking for hydro relief. Every of Stop the clock. Minister of Children and Youth Services, come to order. And when the question is being put, I would appreciate the other comments not to happen on the same side. Finish, please. At every event I attend, someone tells me, more than someone, lots of people tell me they cannot afford their hydro bill. I can't go into a coffee shop without a constituent telling me about the pain that Ontario's electricity policy is causing them. But this government needed to spend 
thousands upon thousands of dollars to hear the obvious. Do Liberal members not speak to their constituents? Do they ignore phone calls? Do they not read their emails? Speaker, why did it take taxpayer-funded polling from the Liberal campaign manager for this government to recognize the mess they've created in this province? What everybody else already knows that electricity prices are too high. Question. How could they have kept their heads in the sand this long? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Speaker, as I said earlier, we have taken concrete, real steps to reduce energy costs. But, Speaker, we stand by the decision that we made to shut down the coal-fired plants. Coal is the cheapest energy, Speaker, but we actually put a value on the health of the people of this province. Member from Nipissing, come to order. Hospitalizations due to dirty air have declined by 41 percent. When we see deaths, premature deaths, reduced by 23 percent because of the decision we made to, to have clean come to order. energy in this province, we remain committed that this was the right decision and remains the right decision. We are opposed to coal-fired plants, Speaker. I'm not sure where the opposition stands on that, but our decision to shut down the coal-fired plants was absolutely the right approach to you. you see it, please? you see it, please? Start the clock. No question. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Back to the Deputy Premier. My last question wasn't about coal, it was about the poll. <laughs> Speaker, my question back to the Deputy. Every day I hear another hydro horror story. Yep. Often it's a story of a business closing because they can no longer afford to pay their electricity bills. Speaker, I say to I asked the Deputy Premier, how long? How long will she allow businesses Ministers, to close culture, in this province sport. to continue to close because of the electricity crisis that your party has created for business in this province? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Yeah, for the member to suggest, even in this legislature, a partisan body uh, we all know, for the member to suggest that the Ontario's economy is not going well, that Ontario's economy is not growing, that businesses across Ontario are not growing, that rather they're shrinking, either suggest that the member is completely misinformed, Mr. Speaker, and is not paying attention to what's happening in the economy, or, Mr. Speaker, he's just trying to score political points spinning, in this legislature. Spinning. Just spinning. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, we're up 642,000 net jobs in this province, Mr. Speaker, since the recession. That's a good thing. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, and we'll find out today, our finance minister will talk about projected growth today, but BMO suggests that we're going at 2.6 per cent this year for growth in our economy. Answer. That's faster than every G7 nation, Mr. Speaker. So the member on this particular question, Mr. Speaker, I would suggest is sorely missing. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Supplementary. Speaker, I think Lewis Carroll writes the answers for the minister. Despite the spin this government offers, it is clear they aren't doing enough to keep business operating in Ontario. Just over a week ago, it was announced that Cambridge Towel was shutting its doors. The factory is closing despite the fact that the members from Cambridge and Kitchener Centre went to the factory and told everyone how great everything was in this province and how great the government was and how they are listening to the people. I'll read you a quote from the Cambridge Times. The member from Cambridge said, we are hearing that everyday Ontarians, and I quote, we are hearing that everyday Ontarians can certainly use help with lower costs of electricity and that she believes this week's energy rebates and saving announcements will show the government is listening to concerns. Speaker, is listening to the Question. concerns of the 160 people who are about to lose their jobs because of high electricity rates, is that enough? Listening to the concerns? Or Thank is you. it time that this government took
very familiar with uh, with this particular company, Cambridge Towel. It's a company that we've partnered with in the past. The it's a company that is an excellent company, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, Cambridge Towel did not get a contract that they've a long-standing contract they've had in the past, and that's what's created their challenges, Mr. Speaker. We hope that they will emerge from their, their current position and continue to be able to uh, to provide a good product and provide those jobs, Mr. Speaker. The sad part about Cambridge Towel, Mr. Speaker, is they were this close to be able to benefit from one of our important Member changes we've made to our energy policy, our ICI program, where they would have been one of the 1,000 companies that would have seen up to a third of their energy costs reduced. So we hope this company makes it through this challenging time, Mr. Speaker, and we hope they get. Thank you. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order. Final supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier or the Minister. <clears throat> I'll read you another quote from Cambridge Chowell, Chief Executive Officer, said the company chose to remain in Canada, but at a price. And I quote, We decided to stay here, but there's a penalty for staying here. Higher costs. Well, now it appears that those higher costs were just too high. And this Liberal government has cost over 160 people their jobs. Wow. Speaker, will the Premier's office send the members from Cambridge and Kitchener back for another photo op with the 160 workers as they're walked out the door when Cambridge Tower closed its doors? Or will that be a photo op that they just won't have time to make? Yep. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, rather than talk down uh, our, to the, to Ontario's economy and Canada's economy, the member ought to be, Mr. Speaker, be dealing with the facts. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we've led North America in, in attracting foreign direct investment for two out of the last three years. The fact is, we've gotten rid of the capital tax that's saving our companies hundreds of millions of dollars. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we've also lo we, we, we brought in the HST, which is providing hundreds of millions of dollars of advantages to companies like Cambridge Towels. The fact is, we've put in place the lowest effective corporate tax rate in all of North America, Mr. Speaker, something that's helping us to attract those investments. This is a competitive economy. It continues to be competitive. We still have work to do. We're going to work in partnership with our business community to become even more competitive, continue to attract more jobs, to continue to innovate, and continue to lead North America in growth, Mr. Speaker. That's where we need to be. That's where we Thank plan you. to be. Good question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. It's now been almost two weeks since we learned that the Premier's top aide, Pat Cerbera, was charged with two violations of the Elections Act, two weeks since the shocking allegation that Ms. Sorbera allegedly offered the Minister of Energy an enticement to run for the Premier's Liberal Party. People are disappointed with this Premier Speaker and the scandals of her Liberal Party. Why won't the Premier do what virtually every Premier before her has done, do the honourable honourable thing, Speaker, and remove her Minister of Energy until his role in the Sudbury by-election scandal is determined? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And um, I think we've we've discussed this matter uh, in a fair bit of detail um, uh, in this house, and I very much appreciate your uh, your ruling earlier today uh, as well, uh, Speaker. As I've stated uh, before, uh, and all members know, that this is a matter that is before the courts, and it will be highly in inappropriate for uh, for this legislature to uh, to speak. Uh, matters that are before uh, before uh, our court. It's also very clear, Speaker, that the Minister of, uh, of Energy is under no investigation whatsoever, and there are no charges laid against him as well. Uh, he continues to do his very important job as the Minister of Energy, and he uh, is focused in, make, in making sure uh, that uh, we are building a clean, reliable energy system, and we're making sure that we continue to keep the prices uh, of, of hydro um, uh, reasonable Answer. level as well by ensuring that we're cutting 8% HST uh, from uh, hydro bills. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Sir. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, this is not about trying the case. It's about doing the principled thing when a minister is involved in a uh, in an issue that is actually before the courts. The Minister of Ener Energy is implicated in a very serious allegation. The people of Ontario need to know that their government and their representatives have integrity 
integrity beyond reproach. We are not asking to try this case in the Legislature, Speaker, and the Deputy Premier, the Attorney General, actually know this. Uh, that's uh, that's what people expect, Speaker. Uh, what we and Ontarians everywhere are asking for, in fact, is that the Minister of Energy step aside from his cabinet rule until these allegations have been properly dealt with. So my question is, why won't this Liberal government do the principled thing, the thing that should be done, and simply ask that minister to step aside Answer. and reassure Chief the Whip, people of Ontario time. that the Premier can put aside blind partisanship and prioritize the people of Ontario's Thank fate you. in government? Governor, Speaker, the Minister, of, the Minister of Energy is not implicated in this matter. There are no allegations no. towards him whatsoever. He's under no investigation, no. Uh, and there are no charges against him either, Speaker. Uh, the Minister of uh, um, Energy and, 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 and the context of his, his portfolio are under no question whatsoever in this matter, Speaker. So I, um, I do not see a connection between what the, the member opposite is trying to make to the— to, Finish, please. There is no connection between uh, the role of the Minister of Energy as, as the minister responsible for a very important file um, and the allegations uh, uh, in this matter, which does not touch the minister nor uh, his responsibility um, as, the, as a minister. As Premier said, the minister will continue to uh, do the excellent work he's doing in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, yet again, the Premier and her Liberal government are defending and protecting Liberal insiders. This time it happens to be the Minister of Energy. When will this Premier wake up and realize that the longer she lets the Minister of Energy remain in Cabinet, the more damage that she and her Liberal government do to the people's faith in democracy in Ontario. The Premier needs to show leadership here, Speaker. She needs to realize that this is about more than just protecting one of her MPPs. This is about letting people know that politicians in Ontario are more about more rather than blind party loyalty or partisan politics. I ask the Deputy Premier again. Will the Premier finally show some leadership and ask her Minister of Energy to step aside until this matter is through the courts and decided? Speaker, if anybody is who's showing partisan streak or demonstrating partisan politics is the leader of the third party oh, yeah. by continuing to ask, uh, uh, ask about a matter that is before the courts. Instead of focusing on real issues that matters to Ontarians, she's focused on, on something, Speaker, that the Minister of en Energy is not implicated in. There are no allegations against the Minister of Energy. He is under no investigation, Speaker, and there are no charges laid Personal against him uh, whatsoever. Minister of Energy continues to do his work. Perhaps, uh, Speaker, the NDP and, the, and, and uh, the leader of the third party are still not over the fact that they lost that by-election, and then the Minister of Energy, who's been a great community champion, was successful, Speaker. So if anybody uh, uh, is, is diving into, into politics and partisanship is the NDP. I think they've got to get over it. The, uh, the Minister of Energy is a hard-working uh, constituent MPP Answer. who has served his com community for many, many years as Speaker, and he will continue to yeah. do so. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. The leader of the third party. My next uh, question is for the Deputy Premier Speaker, but I have to say there's no wonder the Liberals are where they are these days when they don't think that allegations of bribery are in any way important to the people of Ontario. Pretty serious stuff, Speaker. Look, if the Premier won't uh, ask her Minister of Energy to resign over the alleged bribery scandal, she should over the mess that he's helped her make in our energy system. Two weeks ago, I stood on the banks of the Ottawa River right across from Gatineau, Quebec. According to Hydro-Quebec survey from April of this year, the average hydro bill that families pay in Gatineau is about $100. In Ottawa, where I was standing, that same very survey says the average bill is $224. Wow. Quebec's hydro system is completely public, Ontario's is not, so I have a simple question for the Deputy Premier. Does she see the connection between the high cost of Ontario's hydro and the fact that we have a system question. that Conservatives and Liberals have been privatizing for the last 20 years? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, um, you know, I actually happened to have a copy of that uh, report that the leader of the third party was referring to that compares energy prices in cities in Ontario, around Ontario, and other communities. So let me just share. Um, in, in Toronto, 
Uh, $246 a month is the average bill for uh, 1,000. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, speaker, second time. In Ottawa, 224, as the, as the member said. In Boston, that number is $383. In New York City, that number is $409. In Chicago, that number is $210. Speaker, I could go on, but what I can tell you is that our energy rates are competitive with other municipalities, Speaker, but we do understand Answer. that people need relief from their electricity prices, and that is exactly why, Thank you. starting in January, prices. Thank you. Supplementary. Rules may want to swim at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to high hydro rate, Speaker, but certainly Ontario families and businesses expect better from their government. The Premier's sell-off of Hydro One affects everyone, Speaker, everyone who lives in this province. I recently sat down with Alex and Sherry Moore. Alex and Sherry live in London with their three children. They've watched their hydro bill nearly double since the same time last year. The cost of hydro means they can't save for their kids' future, and they're concerned about being able to afford to enroll them in after-school programs and sports. Like people all across Ontario, the sell-off of Hydro One means life is getting tougher for Alex and Sherry, and it means it's harder for them to give their children every opportunity that they deserve. When will this Liberal government help families like Alex and Sherry's and stop Question. the sell-off of Hydro One? Well, Speaker, we are making investments that will reduce by 8 per cent electricity bills for people right across the province. Everyone is going to benefit from that 8 per cent reduction, and those in the most rural parts of the province are going to see a 20 per cent reduction in their delivery charges. Speaker. We are very much aware of the burden that high electricity prices play in household budgets across this province, Speaker, but we are taking important steps to reduce that burden. At the same time, we have replaced our energy infrastructure. We have shut down the coal-fired plants. That is more expensive. Green energy is more expensive if you just look at the cost of electricity. But when we can bring down hospitalizations by 41 per cent, when we can reduce premature deaths by 23 per cent, we're Answer. talking about a reduction in the number of deaths because of a decision we made to bring cleaner energy to Ontario. Thank I stand you. by that decision. We stand by that decision. Yeah. Speaker, the Deputy Premier can spew out as many Liberal lines as she likes, but the people of this province are not confident in what this government has done with our electricity system. That is the bottom line. Last week, I visited newlyweds, Sean and May Evans in Sarnia, and they too told me about how hard it has been to keep up with their skyrocketing hydro bills. Sean and May were forced to get a roommate to help out with their hydro bills. They have put their dream of starting a family on hold because they just can't risk the additional financial burden when they don't know how much more their bills are going to go up. I've been in London, Hamilton, Kitchener, Sudbury, Ottawa, Sarnia, Kingston. Everywhere I go, Speaker, people ask me what they can do to stop the sell-off of Hydro One. Everywhere, the people from ask me that Justin question. Russell, come Does this order. Deputy Premier understand question. how this wrong-headed sell-off is hurting Ontarians, and will her government finally put a stop to any further sell-off of Hydro One and do what the people want her to do? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, um, I think all of us in this House have, uh, have been hearing from constituents about various costs and various challenges they face, and we are doing everything we can to address those challenges. Speaker, when it comes to helping families, I am thrilled at the changes we are making to OSAP. Reducing the cost to post secondary education. We're eliminating the financial barrier to post education. That's going to help all of the families in this province who are faced with uh, decisions about whether or not their kids can go on to post secondary. We want every student in this province to work hard, to get marks, to get accepted, and then we are going to make sure that money uh, does not stand in the way of them achieving their full potential. It's an important initiative. It's a profoundly important initiative, Speaker, for all of us, not just those Answer. who will benefit directly from this, Speaker.
And your question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Minnesota. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. We all know the minister enjoys talking about the millions and millions of taxpayer dollars that this government hands out to private corporations. Forgotten in all the political spin is reality for failed companies like Wintronics, Arc Productions, and now, sadly, Cambridge Towel and their workers. Speaker, just over seven weeks ago, this government used Cambridge Towel as a backdrop for another shameless political announcement, this time about, and I quote, reducing energy costs. Over 160 workers will lose their jobs when Cambridge Tower closes, and yet another example of sky-high hydro rates costing real jobs and hurting Ontario families. Speaker, how many plants have to close and how many people have to lose their jobs Question. before the minister will admit there is a hydro crisis facing Ontario's manufacturers? Mr. Speaker, this province has just seen in the last number of weeks $1.7 billion announced to be invested in our auto plants, Mr. Speaker, that's going to support and save tens of thousands, if not millions, of jobs across this province. And, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite opposes all the partnerships that we've done in the past with those plants. His party, Mr. Speaker, his members said, let those plants close. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We refuse to do that. The result is thousands of jobs in Windsor, thousands of jobs in St. Catharines, thousands of jobs in Oshawa, thousands of jobs in Woodstock, Mr. Speaker, thousands of jobs across this province because of the partnerships that you opposed. Just over 300 days ago, I wrote to this minister asking him to release the information on the business grants that this government has handed out since 2004. Recently, the minister released information going back only to 2013, including a government grant for $190,000 to Cambridge Towel, the same company that is laying off 160 people and closing its doors. Speaker, this grant was awarded just a couple years ago, and now we know that families in and around Cambridge are going to be without work as we approach Christmas. Minister, that's extremely sad. Mr. Speaker, how many more factories does the Minister of Economic Development and Growth expect to close before Christmas due to his government's electricity rates and other failed Liberal policies? Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, uh, we feel strongly, and we feel for those workers that uh, that are, our jobs are in jeopardy that are being laid off at Cambridge Towel. But, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, this member is trying to have it both ways. One minute he's saying help those companies, the next minute he's saying he he, he opposes those yeah. very programs that help those companies. We're proud of the investment we made some time ago with Cambridge Towel. It helped them continue to grow when things were going well for them, Mr. Speaker. We're proud of the investments that we've made. Uh, with with our, with our partners in the business community. We've invested $2.8 billion, Mr. Speaker. $29 billion of private sector dollars have, have been leveraged from that. 160,000 Ontarians have jobs, Mr. Speaker, out of those investments we've made, investments we're proud to have made, investments he and his leader continue Answer. to oppose, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Deputy Premier. When the Premier was elected in 2014, she promised that she would be different. She promised a clean slate, a break from her party's scandal-ridden recent past. Instead of a break from the past, we have more broken promises and more scandal. The Premier and her government need to take very seriously the implication of the Minister of Energy in the allegations of bribery. She needs to show the people who voted for her that she will put the interests of Ontarians before the political interests of her party. Speaker, to the Deputy Premier, when will the Minister of Energy be stepping down from Cabinet? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, Minister, uh, Attorney General. Well, thank you very much again, uh, 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 Speaker. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that NDP continues to 
ask questions which they know are are not relevant uh, to the matters that uh, um, are before this house. Uh, I think the NDP also speaker knows that the Minister of Energy is under no investigation. Uh, there are no allegations towards him, and there are no charges towards him as well. Uh, speaker, vendetta. he is uh, he is somebody who is hardworking. He's earnest, who works extremely hard to serve his community of Sudbury. Uh, as the Minister of Energy, he is focused in making sure that we continue to improve to the everyday lives of Ontarians. Uh, one of the very important measures, Speaker that he's brought forward is, is permanently cutting 8 per cent of the HST from all hydro bills that will come into effect on January the 1st, 2017. Uh, speaker, the member uh, from Sudbury will continue you. to do his job. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier. The fact that this government is using a court case where two top Liberal political aides are being accused of breaking election law as a reason to not answer what is really a straightforward question speaks volumes, speaks volumes, Speaker. If the Deputy Premier had been implicated in a bribery scandal, would she not step aside until her name had been completely cleared? Wouldn't she want the people in her riding and across Ontario to have complete faith in her integrity and her honesty? Wouldn't she? You'd think so. Someone else here. Yeah. Speaker, the, the facts are as follows. Um, uh, there are uh, allegations in a matter. A personal Two vendetta. individuals who do not serve in this House are charged in that matter. That matter is before court. The Minister of Energy is not uh, implicated. Uh, Minister of Energy, Speaker, is under no investigation, uh, and Speaker, there are no charges towards the Minister of no. Energy whatsoever. Furthermore, Speaker, the matters that is dealt with in that issue has nothing to do with the roles and responsibilities of the minister as the minister of energy. In fact, Speaker, these are the facts. NDP can try to ignore the facts, um, and that's their prerogative, Speaker. But the facts of this matter is clear. There is no reason whatsoever for the minister of energy to step down. Answer. In fact, there's even more reason, Speaker, that he continues to serve the people of Sudbury, that he'll continue to serve as the minister of energy. He's doing Thank a good you. job at it, and we have full faith and confidence in him. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Recently, I joined the minister and a member from Etopical Centre to announce the proposed changes that will increase consumer protections for, house, uh, for household services. One of the proposed changes in the legislation is to regulate the home inspection industry. Buying a home is the largest investment many Ontarians make in their lifetime. That's right. Consumers want and need to be confident in making these purchases every step of the way. Home inspectors play a crucial role in that process. That's right. However, it is one of the only professions involved in a real estate transaction that, does not, uh, that is not provincially licensed. Speaker, can the minister inform this House on how our government question. plans to add accountability to the industry and further build consumers' confidence? Great question. question. Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say thank you to the member from Trinity Spadina for the important question and also his continued work on advocating regarding on advocacy regarding the issue. Consumer hiring a home inspector should be able to expect a level of expertise, quality, and consistency. Our government intends to address this issue through regulating the home inspection industry and, as a result, straining consumer confidence and increasing accountability within the sector. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our government's record of listening to consumers and creating the protection they need and deserve. And this is why we are moving forward with the proposed legislation I introduced earlier this month, which, if passed, will establish mandatory licensing for home inspectors practicing in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our government yes, is dedicated sir. to ensuring that every Ontarian can be confident in every purchase they make. Thank you. Good. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to uh, thank the minister for her answer. 
This is a very important step forward for both consumers and the industry. Absolutely. I know that regulating home inspection industry will bring consistency to the profession through minimum qualification that all of us can support. In my riding and many ridings across the province, homeowners, including condo owners, can really use this valuable service with the confidence when they know the home inspectors are provincially licensed. Minister, speaker, can the minister provide further details in her plan to regulate the home inspection industry? Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you again to the member from Trinity Spadina for his advocacy on this very important issue. Mr. Speaker, in addition to setting minimum, minimum qualification for home inspectors, the proposed legislation, if passed, will allow for the creation of a new administrative authority to oversee and enforce the new rules. This authority will be able to establish additional licensing requirements, a code of ethics for licensing, and set the technical standard for home inspections. Mr. Speaker, if the proposed legislation is passed, our government plans to continue to work with the industry to ensure consumers are protected and confident, confident when buying a home. Our goal is to build a fair, safe and informed marketplace for all Ontarians. And Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to helping consumers make informed choices yes, to protect their hard-earned money, which is why we are bringing accountability for the home inspection industry. Thank you. No question, the member from Leeds, Grimble. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Deputy Premier. Like Speaker, the Premier refuses to come clean about who gave the orders to make the alleged offers that have resulted in Pat Cerbera facing bribery charges that under know. the Elections that Act. Know. Her silence in the face of these unprecedented charges is an insult to Ontarians who deserve the truth. Yeah. But the Premier isn't the only key player from this government involved in the Sudbury by-election. As Liberal campaign co-chair, the Deputy Premier would also have played a role. Good point. Speaking Good point. as campaign co-chair, what knowledge did the Deputy Premier have about any inducements or offers? Good point. I think she knows. Deputy Premier. Governor House Leader. Well, Speaker, feels a bit like deja vu. Feels like we've gone back two weeks in time. I think, Speaker, the opposition has been asking these same questions, and you've been very clear. Once um, uh, earlier last week, in sort of letting all members know about the subjudice uh, rule, and Speaker, you very eloquently just um, uh, gave a ruling uh, to, in response to my point of order on that issue, exactly highlighting the fact that the opposition is trying to uh, to litigate a matter that uh, in the House, that is before, before the House, they are making uh, implications that there are other individuals involved when uh, when we know the matter as it relates to only two individuals um, who have been who have been charged who do, uh, do not sit um, in this house, Fair Speaker. Field. So all this to say, Speaker, that I will uh, um, you know uh, the government or I will not um, engage in this conversation, Speaker, in this house. Answer. This matter is before before the courts, and I I respectfully uh, ask all members uh, to uh, to to respect uh, the rule and Thank your ruling. You. Thank That's you. Right. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, I'm going to try again back to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, I know, I know this government would rather talk about anything else this morning, but this unprecedented scandal is directly connected to the Premier's office. And with the Minister of Energy named in a charge laid by the OPP, this scandal has now landed at the Cabinet table. Yeah. We have a responsibility on behalf of all Ontarians to get to the bottom of who gave the orders to Pat Sorbera. The Premier won't answer, and the Minister of Energy won't do the honourable thing and step aside. Speaker, will the Deputy Premier tell us about her role in the Sudbury scandal, or is she going to uphold the Liberal tradition and deny Ontarians the answers yeah, yeah. they demand? Again, Speaker, um, the member asked exactly the same question that he asked the first time, which he's asked repeatedly before. And, Speaker, the answer does not change. This matter is before the courts. The, uh, it's the responsibility of a judge, Speaker, uh, to weigh all the evidence that is pre presented before her or him uh, and make a de determination. It's up to a judge, Speaker, based on the evidence that uh, she or he hears. Uh, to get to the bottom of it, to quote Thank the member you. opposite, Speaker, um, the Speaker, uh, the standing order rule.
rules that you quoted, uh, quoted so eloquently in, in your ruling earlier uh, today is absolutely clear, Speaker, and that is uh, that this House should not engage uh, in, in any matter that is before the court uh, or, uh, or a, a quasi-judicial tribunal, Speaker, for a simple reason of not prejudicing those, those producing uh, proceedings. The member opposite is trying to prejudice this matter, and I had, I, Speaker, Thank that's you. highly inappropriate. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Twelve days ago, I stood here in this legislature to ask the Premier to reunite a Niagara couple who've been separated by the long-term care system after 70 years of marriage. And I was pleased to hear the Minister of Health say that this couple should never have been separated in the first place. But unfortunately, 12 days later, Clarence and Jesse are still waiting to be reunited. Clarence is 93 years old, is living at Shalom Manor in Grimsby. Jesse is 92 years old, and she's living at a home in St. Catharines. They miss each other terribly, and they need to be together. How much longer will Clarence and Jesse have to wait before they are reunited? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm confident that this couple will be reunited, reunited rather very, very soon. I have that confidence, and the member opposite knows that I have been diligently working uh, on this uh, issue. I know he also appreciates that I can't speak to the specifics at all. It would be a violation of the privacy rights of, of the couple. Uh, that being said, uh, my office is working closely, uh, I would say almost on a daily basis, with either the CCAC or the Lynn uh, involved uh, to make sure that we're addressing uh, this. And the member is, is right on this point that this couple should not be separated. It has been uh, uh, just under two weeks, I believe, since this was first brought to my attention. And I want to reassure uh, the member opposite. In fact, I want to reassure this legislature and all Ontarians that this is one of my highest priorities to reunite this couple. Yes, I can't speak to the specifics of the case for privacy reasons, but I'm working on it uh, each and every single day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Acting Premier. Couples like Clarence and Jesse shouldn't be separated by our long-term care system, but they should get the respect and dignity they deserve and be able to live all their days with each other. I believe the minister when he says he wants to fix this situation, but Clarence and Jesse are still separated, and every day that passes is another day that they are denied their wish of living together. Will this government do the right thing and re reunite Clarence and Jesse without any further delay? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows uh, that we share the view that this couple need to be reunited, uh, reunited as soon as possible, and we are working to that end. We are uh, working with the CCAC that is tasked with the responsibility for finding uh, the bed available uh, to allow, uh, enable the reunification of this couple. I can't speak to the specifics of the case, and all I can do is say to the member that we're working closely together. I know that my office is updating his office on a very regular basis almost a daily basis. Uh, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we're following the process that is, is there, the legislation that exists, that we changed, in fact, to allow for the reunification of couples such as this uh, elderly couple. Uh, I'm confident that we're going to have it resolved uh, very, very soon. Thank you. A new question. The member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. I appreciated your caution a moment ago. I kind of thought the member opposite was going to say thank you, but I uh, didn't hear that. But my speaker today, sir, is to the uh, Minister of Education. Now, last week was Constituency Week, and out of the very many meetings that I had, wow. I had the pleasure to meet with a company from Quebec called Le Capitel. Wow. Le Capitel provides health benefits to self-employed individuals, and I'm pleased to announce, Speaker, that they gave a $5,000 donation to the Scott Mission in Beaches East York. Wow. And the whole event was organized with the Ontario Electrical League, and I wanted to provide publicly say thank you to all that were involved. But, Speaker, I also heard that the minister attended a very successful event last week discussing with our educational partners about how to improve educational outcomes for students, especially when it comes to well-being and equity. 
and the fundamental principles which is driving everything that we do on this side of the House is that everyone has the opportunity to succeed in Ontario regardless of culture, ethnicity, gender, language, physical or intellectual ability, Christian. race, religion or sexual orientation. Minister, will the speaker, minute, sorry, speaker, will the minister talk to us about that thank event you. she was at? Yes. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from BC's, Beaches East York for that great question. And last week, along with the Premier, PA Anderson, and Associate Minister Nadu Harris, we had a chance to participate in our first Partners in Dialogue Day, an event brought together um, by the ministry with Ontario's education community all under one roof. During this two day summit, we heard views and opinions from all partners, including Francophone partners and communities and Indigenous partners so that we could incorporate their unique identities, cultural backgrounds and perspectives on the issues and priorities affecting our youngest learners. We had more than 500 participants and I look forward to reviewing the feedback that we've heard and strengthening the communications channels we've built to better serve our education system and the needs of all of our students. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Education. You know, I can tell you that one of my favourite things I do as an MPP is when I meet with students, children, the youth in my riding. You know, I've been to many events on healthy smiles, free tuition, and graduation events. And when I meet with these kids, I ask them what their favourite part of school is, Speaker, and they always warm my heart when they respond. Some tell me their favourite thing is a teacher who takes extra time to help them with their learning. Others, shyly and with soft voices, tell me it's about their ability to learn in a safe and accepting school environment or place. So, Speaker, I would ask the minister if she could elaborate on the next steps that our government is taking to build and sustain an equitable and an inclusive educational system. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member, the hardworking member, for their question. I'm proud to say that with our education partners, we have built an education system for the future that balances achievement and equity. But we know that we have more work to do, and we recognize that the inputs of students, parents, teachers is vital if we want to improve student achievement and student staff well-being. That is why we will be holding regional consultations across the province starting tomorrow in Barrie. We're also conducting consultations online where members of the public will be able to provide their feedback on students' well-being on Ontario.ca slash student well-being. Because at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, our children are our most valuable asset, yes, and it sir. is our job to ensure that they feel safe, included, and capable to reach their full potential. Here, here. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Today, the Liberal government will release uh, its fall economic statement highlighting their financial track record. Speaker, this is a record of debt and deficit, significant tax increases, endless waste management and scandals. In his latest report, the Financial Accountability Officer said they have a multi-billion dollar hole in their budget forecast. He confirmed the government is using one-time money from asset sales and contingency funds to artificially balance the budget in an election year. He told us the only way they are going to balance after that is to raise taxes or cut services further. Mr. Speaker, can the Deputy Premier tell us whether they are raising taxes again or whether we can expect more cuts to frontline services in today's fall economic statement? Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I know we all anxiously anticipate one o'clock when the finance minister will deliver the fall economic state statement, Speaker. But I think it's really important to get some facts on the table. When it comes to GDP growth in the first half of this year, it was higher than Canada, higher than the U.S., almost all the G7 countries. Ontario led the way. Our unemployment rate, Speaker. It really doesn't matter where anyone sits. I still hear the voice and I know it. The member from Beaches East York, second time. Finish, please. 
The unemployment rate is at the lowest level in eight years. It's 6.4 per cent. That's been below the national average for 18 months. Speaker, 640,000 net new jobs Answer. since the recession, and we're on track to balance the budget. Moody's has upgraded our credit rating. We will balance, Speaker. Thank you. And the fall economic statement will show us. How Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier, Speaker. Uh, recently, the Auditor General refused to sign off on the government's financial statements. This was unprecedented reason. in Ontario's history. Now they've appointed a taxpayer-funded panel to audit our own independent Auditor General. Oh my goodness. They didn't like what the Auditor had to say, and now they're trying to continue to discredit her. Shame. This is completely inappropriate, Speaker. The people of Ontario cannot trust anything this Liberal government has to say. Their numbers are wrong. We've been telling them they're wrong, and both the Auditor General and the Financial Accountability Officer have confirmed this. Mr. Speaker, will the government come clean and update their false budget projections in today's fall economic statement? President, Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And I too want to uh, assure the member opposite that we are committed to balancing the budget by 2017-18. And not just balance the budget, but as the Financial Accountability Officer notes, we're also incorporating new commitments into our plan so that we can make everyday life easier for Ontarians. But I think it's also important to look at the public accounts because, Speaker, we beat our deficit target for the seventh year in a row using the accounting treatment that the Auditor General wanted. So even with using the Auditor uh, General's accounting treatment, we beat our deficit target seven years in a row. In fact, we, the FAO acknowledges that the Ontario government has held its program growth spending to 1.4% annually. Question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Sir, Premier. Uh, we should be building a great future for every child in this province, but instead, thousands of children are being left behind. A new report today from a coalition of social agencies confirms that Toronto is Canada's child poverty capital. Speaker, 27 per cent of children in this city are living in poverty or in low-income families that are struggling to find good housing and put food on the table. And if we don't make big changes, we will continue to deny tens of thousands of children the great future that we know is possible. When will this government finally, finally take some bold action to actually eliminate child poverty in the City of Toronto and right across Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Minister of Housing and Poverty Reduction. Minister of Housing responsible for poverty reduction. And thank you for that uh, that uh, very good question, uh, Speaker. You know, we uh, we ask government we have to ensure that children and youth get the absolutely the best start in life through strategic investments in education and health care, community supports. And Mr. Speaker, this government has made steady progress towards meeting our target of reducing child poverty by 25 percent. Ontario's first. Minister of Children and Youth Services and the member from Renfrew, another place. Finish, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to emphasize that Ontario's first poverty reduction strategy alone lifted 47,000 children and their families out of poverty and prevented thousands more from falling into poverty, Mr. St Mr. Speaker. We know there's more to do. We need to continue to build on this progress. Yes, sir. And uh, we need to improve the everyday lives of children and their families. And our government remains committed to our goal to reduce child poverty by 25%. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, no child gets their best start in life when their family is living in poverty. No child. City for everyone, Speaker, everyone who lives here. But under this government, Toronto is a divided city. In 2014, this government failed 
failed to meet their child poverty reduction targets. And now, member from Trinity to Spadina, come to order. And I have about three others I'll deal with as well. Please. And now, poverty in Toronto is still at epidemic levels. That's what this report confirms, Speaker. In neighbourhoods like Regent Park and Thorncliffe Park, over 50 per cent of children in those neighbourhoods are growing up in low-income families. We have to change that, Speaker. We need to make sure Question. that the next generation has a real future in this great city. When will this Liberal government finally do the right thing, lift wages for low-income families, and eliminate child poverty in Toronto? Thank you. Minister, start. Please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I think everyone in this House can agree that it's so important that children get uh, a good start at life to make sure they've got that foundation yes. to build a successful life. Yeah. So I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to take this question because I, it allows me just to touch on a few of the things here, here. that this government is doing. For example, Mr. Speaker, we've indexed the Ontario Child Benefit to annual increases. Uh, the maximum benefit rose to $1,336 per child. Wow. Mr. Speaker, we will not be clawing back the uh, the, chi the Canada Child Benefit. Another great uh, another great benefit going through. We've launched the we've launched the Enhanced Youth Action Plan, investing 55 million dollars over three years to help uh, at-risk youth. Mr. Speaker, there's so much that this province is doing. One of the biggest things is providing full-day kindergarten for all four and five-year-old children. 260,000 students, saving families Thank on you. average 65. New question, the member from Northumberland, Country West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to supporting theoretical mathematics and mathematical applications to make a real difference in people's lives. That is why our government continues to support the work done at the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Science. The Field Institute is a globally recognized international center for science, research, mathematical science at the University of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell the members of, a little more about Manjul Baraga and the prestigious Field, Fields Medal? Great, great. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Research Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Northumberland Quinty West for that very timely question. Mr. Speaker, the Fields Medal is in mathematics is the highest international honor that any mathematician can receive. And I am proud to say that wow. Professor Manjul Bargawa is the first Canadian to win this award. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, whenever a Canadian wins an award, whether it is a medal in Olympics or a medal in mathematics, it touches all of us, Mr. Speaker, and there's something we can all be proud of. Mr. Speaker, this is a huge victory for Canada, for Ontario, and a victory to all young Canadians who aspire to one day win the Fields Medal in Mathematics. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science for his answer. Minister, research done at the Field Institute changes the way we approach mathematical problems in various business sectors, including statistics, computer science, engineering, physical and biog biological science, medicine, economics, and finance. Can the minister please tell the members of this house that our government is doing, what our government is doing to support the Field Institute and the STEM learn learners across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member again for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to improving the lives of Ontarians by investing in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's why my colleague, the Minister of, of Education, announced recently that our government will be investing in a renewed math strategy. Our government knows that math is a critical requirement for the jobs of tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, the Fields Institute will receive $10 million in operational funding to make sure they can continue cutting-edge research. Over the past 13 years, our government has invested $30 million into the, into the institute, which has led 
to success stories, for example, in financial sector, Mr. Speaker, such as S&P Capital, IQ, Sigma Capital, and Synchron Capital. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, the number of diabetics in this province has more than doubled. Thousands of diabetics every year across the province develop a foot ulcer that unfortunately never heals and leads to amputation. The health care costs associated with annually from foot ulcer complications is about $400 million. In fact, due to foot ulcers, diabetic patients stay in hospitals up to 70 day, 72 days, costing the health care sector millions of dollars. Speaker, through you to the minister, why are offloading devices proven tools that heal foot ulcers still not available through the assistive devices program? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, um, it's a great opportunity, given that it's World Diabetic Week, to actually uh, speak to this issue. And I thank the member opposite for asking this question. And I, I, um, I want to, uh, to begin by commending the work of all of those who advocate for and provide support for, and of course, including those individuals like my sister, one of those rare insulin-dependent diabetics. She's almost going to have diabetes for 50 years, Mr. Speaker, which would have been unheard of. So this is an issue that's very important to my heart. And it's also the issue of offloading devices and wound care generally is also extremely important to me. And for that reason, I've had a number of meetings uh, with re regards to this issue, and I actually constituted through HQO a task force, a uh, expert panel, which is looking at this exact issue, looking at the evidence, yes, best practices, and I think they're just about to report back to me in terms of the recommendations. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, every four hours a diabetic loses a foot. Public funding for offloading devices is a cost-effective treatment intervention for Ontario. Funding for offloading devices can save the government up to $75 million annually. Speaker, why hasn't this government acted quicker? They continue to pay the $70,000 associated with a foot amputation rather than make investments towards preventative care for pa diabetic patients. Mr. Speaker, the government has wasted millions of dollars on the diabetes registry and billions of dollars on e-health. Now there's an opportunity for this government to save the system now while improving the life of diabetic patients. Speaker, when exactly will the minister commit to providing diabetics with offloading devices? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think there's any distance between uh, myself and the member opposite on this issue. I agree with the cost effectiveness of offloading devices. I agree that the clinical evidence is profound in terms of the potential benefit, uh, but I would hope that the, me the member opposite would also agree that it's prudent for me to wait just a short amount of time because I think they're about to report back to me a, uh, a committee, a task force through HQO that includes uh, experts from uh, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, the experts in wound management care, the association nationally that represents them, all of the right people to provide us with that ex expert advice so we can mo move forward based on that be best evidence and based uh, best practices. But I want to thank the, the member opposite for raising this question today. There are being no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.